hereby I open this academic ceremony at Maastricht University. First of all, I welcome the PhD candidate, Mr. Ahmed Hosni, and he will defend his academic thesis, Deep Learning Applications in Lung Cancer Imaging. And I welcome, of course, all members of the degree committee, and in particular, uh, the two supervisors, Professor Hugo Aerts, he is Professor of Artificial Intelligence and Medicine uh, at Maastricht University, and he is also affiliated with uh, Harvard Medical School in Boston, USA. And I welcome also the co-supervisor, uh, Dr. Raymond Mack. He is Associate Professor of Radiation Oncology at Harvard Medical School, also in Boston, USA. I will introduce the uh, six opponents later during the opposition, later in the ceremony. And of course, I welcome all followers of the live stream. And Mr. Hosni, may I invite you to present a summary of your thesis? Please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, dear Prorector, uh, dear members of the Corona, dear uh, family, friends and audience, in the next 15 minutes, uh, I will be presenting a summary of my uh, PhD thesis. Right. I hope this is available to you now. Um, so my thesis is titled uh, Deep Learning Applications in Lung Cancer Imaging. First, I would like to share uh, with you some context. And so the work presented here lies within uh, the intersection of three areas. Uh, the first area is cancer. And so cancer is a very difficult disease to cure. And despite advancements in uh, genomics and new treatments, uh, deaths from cancer have been continuously on the rise. More specifically, uh, lung cancer is the second most diagnosed cancer uh, in men and women, responsible for around 1.8 uh, million deaths annually. Uh, the second area is medical imaging. Doctors will use technologies to image uh, inside our bodies. And uh, one of these technologies is uh, computed tomography or CT. And CT imaging is uh, routine and it's a standard, um, standard part of, uh, of medical care today. Uh, we have around 75 million scans that are performed annually in the US. And CT is very similar to an X-ray, but in three dimensions. And so it provides a good amount of detail into our bodies. Here you see a CT scan of a lung cancer patient together with the lungs, the heart, uh, and the tumor annotated. And finally, we have uh, artificial intelligence, uh, or more specifically, deep learning. Uh, deep learning is a computational model that consists of uh, artificial neural networks. These are somewhat based on the neural networks uh, in our brains, and they have the ability to learn uh, automatically from data. And we'll be uh, talking about this a little bit more in detail. Uh, they are able to surpass human performance in some tasks. And, and finally, they also um, work very well with images, whether uh, photographic images or uh, medical uh, images. And uh, at this intersection lies the contents uh, of the thesis today. Uh, we will be discussing two projects uh, across two different uh, application types. The first project will look at a prognostic uh, application, predicting the outcome of the disease, such as survival likelihood. And in this project, we will explore if we can use deep learning on CT images of lung cancer patients to differentiate between uh, low survival and high survival patients. The second, we'll look at uh, therapeutic applications. Uh, so this is more on the disease treatment side of things. And we will ask and we will explore if we can use deep learning on CT uh, images or scans of lung cancer patients to help doctors uh, plan for treating these patients uh, with radiation uh, or radiotherapy. And so with that, let's start with the first project and let's start by talking about cancer staging. And so you might have heard about uh, cancer staging, so stages one through four. Doctors will often use a patient's cancer stage to understand how severe the disease is uh, and also to group patients. Uh, we also use stages to decide on what treatments patients should get and what the outcome of disease, the disease uh, might look like. Doctors will often use a patient's uh, CT image, as you can see on the left, and they will measure how big uh, the tumor is. And this piece of information, uh, in addition to others, I will help decide on the patient's uh, stage. This approach is relatively simple and easy to understand and communicate. But because every patient is unique, we will often find that patients within the same stage can have very uh, different outcomes. And so beyond this single measurement of tumor size, 
there may be other patient specific features in the image that uh, we cannot see with, uh, with our eyes. And these features could be helpful in understanding the unique disease profile of that given patient. And so we had mentioned that deep learning learns automatically from data. And for that, uh, we go out and we collect CT images of lung cancer patients together with the associated clinical uh, information about them. Here we are showing the survival time after the start of treatment. And uh, what we've done here essentially is curating our training data. We've collected the inputs uh, to the model, uh, the images, uh, together with the outputs that we expect to see uh, from the model. And the next step uh, is to use this data to train a model. And so deep learning models uh, you know, consists of uh, consecutive layers of neural networks that are connected to one another. And these layers are essentially transforming the image uh, into a single outcome uh, prediction. The training process itself uh, involves adjusting model parameters uh, in order to achieve the best performance possible. Finally, we have model testing, where we provide uh, the model uh, with a CT image of an unseen patient for which we have an associated or known associated uh, clinical outcome. And we ask it to predict uh, this clinical outcome and can then compare it with uh, the value that we have. And this is essentially how we measure the performance of the model. We test this model on uh, hundreds of uh, patient images. Uh, on the top row, you will see results uh, on patients treated with radiotherapy. And in the bottom row, you'll see results uh, on patients treated with surgery. The x-axis on the plots represents the time in years, and the y-axis represents the survivor uh, probability from zero uh, to one. And the blue lines here represent the low-risk patients that have survived longer, and vice versa uh, for the orange lines that represent the high-risk patients. And so you can see our model is able to uh, clearly stratify these two groups. On the right, uh, what we've also done is compare our model uh, to more the traditional measures, such as the tumor diameter measurement that we saw earlier. And the metric we use here on the y-axis is the area under the curve, and so higher values are better. And we find that uh, for surgery patients, uh, deep learning can significantly uh, outperform uh, these other measurement methods. And given further validation, one potential use case for such a model uh, could be for patients that receive uh, combination therapies, uh, such as surgery and chemotherapy. And so using a similar approach could help us spare the low-risk patients from the adjuvant treatment or the second uh, treatment that they are meant to get. And we also perform uh, interpretability studies where we try to identify the parts of the image with the most contributions uh, towards the model predictions. And so on the top, you see the CT images with lung tumors. And in the bottom, uh, you have the corresponding heat maps. Uh, areas in these heat maps, the areas in red, uh, have the highest contributions, and areas in blue have the lowest. And so this is a preliminary qualitative approach but we can see that both areas uh, inside and beyond the tumor are found to be important uh, in this uh, prediction problem by the model. And this aligns with what we know about the importance of tumor surrounding tissue uh, on uh, patient outcome generally. Moving on to the second project. And uh, for that, we will be first uh, introduce radiotherapy. And so radiotherapy together with surgery and chemotherapy uh, are, are the three most common cancer treatments that we have today. And so doctors will use a patient's CT image to produce a treatment plan. And this is what you see on the left. And only after that, uh, radiation uh, can be delivered to the patient as you see on the right. This treatment plan is uh, custom to each, uh, each patient. And so it's based on the geometry of their anatomy. And here the doctors try to maximize the radiation that is delivered to the tumor and minimize the radiation to the surrounding uh, healthy tissue. And as part of this treatment plan, doctors must uh, draw segmentations or outlines. And so, um, you know, uh, what you see here in white are segmentations around the tumor and the diseased lymph nodes. And this essentially becomes the target for the radiation to be delivered. This segmentation task is one of the doctor's most time-consuming tasks. And it has a very large variability between the doctors, which can negatively affect uh, patient outcomes. 
The question is whether we can use deep learning to produce uh, clinically acceptable segmentations in order to help these doctors. And similar to the first project, uh, we collect CT images of lung cancer patients together with the tumor segmentations used uh, in their treatment. And, and we also uh, use a deep learning model um, using this data to train a deep uh, learning model. This model uh, uses a similar mechanism under the hood as the model that we've seen earlier, but as you can see, has a different structure and performs a different task in this case, which is the segmentation task. And so after model training, we test this model on uh, hundreds of uh, patient images. On the y-axis here is a measure of overlap between two segmentations with one uh, being full overlap and zero being no overlap. In purple, we have the difference between segmentations done by the same doctor, and you can see a relatively high overlap. In red, we see the difference between segmentations done by different doctors, and so you see a slightly uh, less overlap in this case. And these are what we consider as our uh, benchmarks or our uh, baselines. We then move on to compare doctor's segmentations with automated segmentations uh, as a result of our model. And you see this in here uh, in blue. So our first test data set is a data set that most resembles the training data, meaning that it comes from the same hospital and is segmented by uh, the same doctor. And we can see that the model performance is still uh, within that red band of doctor to doctor uh, variability. We then test our model on uh, four other data sets that differ from our training data meaning that they uh, come from different hospitals uh, in different countries and have been uh, segmented by uh, other doctors. And we see here a performance drop uh, on these data sets. And that might tell us that some factors such as uh, doctor segmentation styles uh, can affect uh, model performance and how it can generalize uh, to new uh, unseen data. We also did the clinical testing where we involved eight doctors from our hospital to participate in an experiment. And so in red, you have the doctor segmentations, these, these that were used to actually treat these patients. In blue, you have the automated uh, segmentations. And in green, you have eight segmentations uh, by the eight doctors taking part uh, in uh, our experiment. And you can clearly see uh, the variation uh, in these doctors' uh, segmentations. In this experiment, uh, we also measure the time needed to complete the segmentation task by the doctors. So on the graph in blue, you'll see the average time to perform this task uh, from scratch is uh, around 15 minutes. And in orange, when the doctors are given an automated segmentation to start from, this time drops down to around five minutes. This tells us that, um, that we really need end user testing in order uh, to evaluate uh, model performance. Finally, it is also very important for us to understand where uh, the model is failing. So here we have the doctor segmentations in red and the automated segmentations in blue. And what you see on the top row are the areas that have been missed by the model, areas of the tumor missed by the model. And in the bottom, you see areas that were mistakenly included uh, by the model. And one example here to note is uh, in the bottom row in the middle. Uh, here we have a motion artifact where the patient uh, was breathing during the CT imaging, and this motion uh, is expressed in the image. And our model has uh, mistakenly identified the diaphragm, which is a muscle under the lung, as part of the tumor. And so it is very important to identify these failures in order to help guide the next iteration of uh, data and models. And so to summarize, uh, in the first project, we showed that we can use deep learning to extract uh, information from medical images beyond what humans can see. In the second project, we showed that deep learning can assist uh, and improve uh, clinical tasks. And throughout these projects, we try to validate our models with large amounts of data from different patient populations and from other uh, hospitals. And we also try to help other researchers uh, reproduce our results through the use of uh, public data and through making uh, our computational models open source uh, whenever that is uh, possible. Thank you so much uh, for your attention. And so in addition to my supervisors, I would also like to thank everyone that has helped uh, make this work possible. I will now give the floor back to the ProRector. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hosni, for your clear presentation. The opposition will be opened by the chair of the thesis assessment committee, Professor Decker, and he is professor of clinical data sciences at Maastricht University. Professor Decker. Thank you, uh, Prorector, and uh, <clears throat> thank you, dear candidate, for the uh, excellent uh, presentation and also for producing uh, what I think is an exceptional thesis, both in its content, but also in its, um, you know, in its number of chapters, but also the quality of them. I think it's, um, it's worked very well done. And uh, also my congratulations to your um, mentoring team. I have a quite, hopefully you have your propositions with you because I would like to start with proposition number five, which I would like you to read aloud. Sorry, uh, my, sorry, proposition number six, my fault. Proposition number six. Not Number six. Uh, so highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much uh, for your kind words. So a proposition number six reads, uh, deep learning algorithms that learn from experience uh, offer access to unprecedented states of intelligence that in some cases match human intelligence. Right. So this is, this is quite a, um, a bold statement. And I was looking in your chapter, luckily I have the PDF version so I can search through it. And I think it comes from chapter number five, right? Um, and I think specifically, I want to talk to you about figure one on page 115, in which you described your methodology uh, in this uh, chapter. And I think what you, what you meant to say here is that you, you learn a, a network, deep learning uh, network on, um, on radiotherapy. And based on that experience, you, do, you perform transfer learning and you apply that, uh, that transfer learned network on the surgery data set and you're finding that that uh, works quite well. I think that is, uh, can you confirm that, you know, this is what you mean by your networks having experience? Um, the, the, the general uh, point about experience in this case uh, is much, much inherently linked to the idea of uh, engineering features versus learning, uh, learning from data. And, and the idea is uh, by seeing more and more uh, samples uh, of, of a given data set, you're able to build up uh, on this experience. Uh, that, that's more in the general sense. With regards to the, surg the surgery, uh, radiotherapy versus surgery cohorts, uh, we believe that uh, a pre-trained model on the radiotherapy data set uh, has acquired uh, some of this experience by seeing uh, images of uh, radiotherapy patients, and, and that could be used uh, in the surgery context. I understand. Yeah. So, uh, so yes. A question to you is, um, what do you think would happen if the network that was transfer learned and so that you applied in surgery, if that network, you apply that network in the radiotherapy data, what do you think would happen? Would it work? Do you think? So uh, in this case, it would be a transfer learning from radiotherapy to radiotherapy or from surgery to radiotherapy. So, I mean, if you do, you, um, suppose I, I have a, uh, a human, right? A human that delineates, for instance, um, let's say lung cancer patients, right? Uh, if that person has that experience and then I, I tell that person, well, will you learn, uh, will you now come to me had a neck cancer patients, right? A human has some experience from lung and it will be able to transfer, learn that to, um, to, to head and neck and be able to delineate head and neck cancer patients. However, I hope you're familiar with the concept of catastrophic forgetting, right? This is not the same for AI. So my question would be, in this transfer learning from radiotherapy to surgery, will the AI not forget how to do the radiotherapy patients? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, um... Uh, you know, when we talk about um, uh, any general kind of uh, artificial intelligence that we have access to today, we're talking about the very narrow uh, tasks, meaning tasks that uh, are, are very highly specific and models that can perform a single task only. And we have, we are really, uh, when, when we kind of, you know, comparing uh, you know, artificial intelligence to human intelligence in that way, uh, with regards to how we think and how we can extrapolate knowledge learned in one area and apply it in another, that is obviously not something that we see uh, with, with the models that we have uh, today. Right. So you agree yeah. with that, that, that artificial intelligence in that sense will never match human intelligence because it's quite different, right? Do you agree with yes. that? Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely, yes. 
Uh, a second question uh, that I have <clears throat> is about um, um, also a great chapter, which is about your nutrition label for data, huh? data quality especially. Um, now I've looked through your thesis, but I haven't, I haven't seen a definition of data quality. What do you mean by data quality? Um, data quality, uh, I think, highly, highly depends on the, on the data and the nature of the task uh, that you are modeling for. Um, in the context of uh, imaging, for instance, um, CT imaging, for instance, uh, we are looking at certain data characteristics, um, such as uh, absence or presence of artifacts, uh, such as um, more technical parameters, such as slice thickness, the presence or absence of uh, contrast, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's, it, do you think this is the characteristics of the, uh, characteristic of the data? Um, with regards to the nutrition label, um, you know, the, the label was designed to be highly generic, um, mainly for tabular data sets. So, you know, you have a tabular data set and you want to quantify uh, or be able to get a snapshot of how, what, what the contents of, of the data is. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. so my, 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 my hypothesis is, right, that data quality is not the characteristics of the data, it's the characteristic of the question, right? Much like you say, right? You might say, well, for my question to delineate whatever, you know, lung tumors, then you know, artifacts are uh, bad, right? But if I want to do, if I want to design an artifact detecting deep learning algorithm, I want to have artifacts, right? So you can't say data quality is a matter of the data. It's a matter of the question. Do you agree with me? Um Indeed, I agree and believe that uh, it, it, it is a matter of formulating the right question. Right. And based on, based on formulating the question, uh, then identifying the specifications uh, of the data that would help you answer this question, indeed. Yeah, I, so I think we we're in total agreement, right? You first define your question, right? And your question determines you know, what data you need, but also what quality you need, right? Because it really depends on, um, on, on how good you know, your AI is, is needed, right, for an actionable insight that, you know, boils down to uh, what data quality you need. Correct. Okay. So um, my uh, seven minutes is up, so I will give the word back um, uh, to the pro-rector. Or oh, do I have a small, I have a small question left? Okay, that's good, right? Doesn't happen often. Uh, <laughs> so the other um, uh, question I have was on, on uh, deep learning versus handcrafted features, right? I think you, you make a good point that deep learning generally wins, right? If you, if you, if you would um, uh, go for pure performance, but you make the statement that human bias, um, um, in, especially in handcrafted features is, is something we, um, you know, that, that kind of means that handcrafted features are, are probably uh, less good than deep learning features. Um, I was wondering if you think the same of the, the most predictive feature, which is volume. Yes, um, volume uh, is a very, very special case. Uh, and I think the reason behind it is that uh, one can look at an image and identify a tumor as being large or being of high volume. Uh, whereas um, an expert is not able to look at um, an image and say, I believe that um, um, feature number 22, which measures uh, texture or energy in the image with this specific uh, you know, uh, formulation and mathematical formulation is over uh, expressed in this image because of a specific uh, feature. And so, so in that sense, um, most uh, handcrafted features are, although we have mathematical formulations for them, they are not very interpretable. Uh, whereas volume, I would really uh, put it in a, in a bucket on its own simply because uh, that's something that uh, humans can read very well. Right, okay, I agree with you. I'll give the word back to the board. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Decker. The opposition will be continued by Professor van Ginneke. He is Professor of Medical Image Analysis at the Radboud University Medical Center in Nijmegen, the Netherlands. Professor van Ginneke. Thank you very much. Uh, dear candidates, I also would like to congratulate you with a very impressive thesis. I really enjoyed uh, reading it. I also would like to congratulate your all uh, team. Um, and I was a bit shocked that you immediately said to your first opponent when he gave you some other question that the human in, uh, artificial intelligence will never match human intelligence. I was even a bit afraid that you were going to say that engineered features are as good as artificial intelligence, but luckily you didn't do that. Um, now I would 
like to uh, ask some questions about chapter eight. And I'm lucky because you highlighted chapter eight in your presentation, so we can uh, immediately jump into it. You, you write at uh, the end of the conclusion in the abstract that you have presented a validation strategy that may help assess the utility beyond proof of concept stage, provide confidence in pursuing prospective clinical trials. I'm, I'm always amazed how, how people always want to do prospective clinical trials. So I would like to get back to that at the end of the discussion. Um, and and let, let's start with a, a simple question. Um, you have developed a number of uh, 3D UNET models, four 3D UNET models, you write on page 185, um, for localization segmentation of the lungs, primary tumor, as well as the lymph nodes. So do I understand correctly that you then have four units, two are for the lungs, one for the tumor, one for the lymph nodes, or I didn't really get why, why you have four models. Hi, highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you very much for the kind words and for the question. Um, the models, we, we find that the unit uh, is very useful in both um, localization and segmentation tasks, uh, which, which makes it a, a multimodal um, a kind of architecture. And so we have a, uh, a, first of all, a lung localization model. That's the first model, uh, followed by a, um, a tumor detection uh, model that essentially goes out and looks for the tumor, uh, followed by a third uh, tumor uh, segmentation uh, model. And so we have two models here because we uh, tend to operate on uh, different ROI sizes that are uh, kind of downsampled. Uh, the, fourth, the fourth model is a model that looks at the mediastinum area. Uh, so it's, uh, it's already localized and tries to uh, identify the diseased uh, lymph nodes. Okay, uh, so, so then basically when, when the user plays these seeds, because that's what, what they do in this uh, chapter, that's what you show, then, then you apply the correct model. Uh, uh, um, correct. The, uh, the, the seed point uh, is, uh, is uh, the, with, with using the seed point, we're assuming an assisted pipeline. So in that case, uh, the user is assisting the model. So in this case, it's only a single model. Uh, but the combination of the four models is meant for the automated pipeline, uh, where you're just uh, feeding in an image and yes, and trying to submit. So the, the one where the user clicks somewhere, then you have a single unit that, uh, that is applied. Okay. And then you also write um, that you use the NN unit for hyperparameter tuning. There yeah, I was confused because a uh, NN unit is a plug and play model that you could have used in, instead of your four models. So uh, why did you only use it for hyperparameter tuning? And what does that mean? Yes, so it, um, first of all, it was a kind of an issue for, of, of timing actually, because we had already developed um, our, our pipelines and uh, we're performing a hyperparameter tuning, which takes, takes a while. And uh, we realized that um, the, what, what NN unit is proposing is saying that uh, one can use the vanilla unit as it is uh, without uh, any kind of additional architecture components uh, and simply make, make, make simple adjustments to the hyperparameters uh, based on the size of the input data and, and, and other factors. Uh, and so we, we found th that kind of marrying our um, modeling uh, with extracting hyperparameters uh, from what, what NN unit is suggesting uh, was kind of a viable uh, path forward. But I, I do agree with you that uh, it, it would be indeed possible to, um, to utilize something like NN unit uh, out of the box as it is. Did you compare with your unit? But we did not, no. It would be yeah. interesting, right? You say you make your stuff open source, set up a challenge on Grand Challenge, compare the yes. two, and then units yes. uh, turns out to perform very, very well on a lot of problems. That is correct, yes. All right, so then let's go to these um, results where you showed the performance of your, um, your method on what you call ex increasingly external data sets. It's also the graph that you showed during the presentations, figure two on page 190. And you use your um, small data sets for which you have inter-observer and intra-observer variability. And then you kind of extend the band to the other data sets where you sort of imply that if, if you can reach that band, then your method is performing very well. At, at least that's how I interpret why, why you drew this uh, bar. Um, but I was wondering, is, is that really fair? Because um, on these other data sets, 
maybe these are much harder data sets. If you would have actually measured intra and inter observer variability on these data sets, you might have found quite different performance, right? Uh, absolutely, that, that is that is correct. Um, you know, our, our use uh, of the benchmarking data sets, and, and, and to your point, um, th these benchmarks, you know, one could ideally develop benchmarks that are data set specific, and, and this way you would be able to have really uh, fair comparisons. Um, our use for benchmarks are really as a, you know, communication tool, as, as a way to say, uh, this is what uh, doctor's, per doctor's performance, this is the variability in doctor's performance, both uh, inter and intra. Uh, and, um, and and it's just a baseline to be able to uh, compare the models to. And with specifics to the comments about uh, harder data sets, uh, indeed, one of these external data sets is a clinical trial data set from 180 uh, different institutions. So that, that essentially means at least 180 different uh, doctors have uh, segmented this, uh, which makes it an uh, exceptionally difficult, um, difficult data set uh, to, uh, to test on. And, uh, and that's, I think, one of, one of the things that we uh, discuss uh, in this chapter as well. But, but, but then aren't you actually saying that you should measure the intra and inter-observer variability on every external data set that you test on and then compare AI with performance of humans on that same data set? Um, I mean, that would be one way uh, to do it. Uh, the, the, the problem here would be uh, with, you know, who, who is going to perform the inter and the intra uh, observations? Uh, who is going to perform the segmentations? Uh, you know, uh, are we biasing our model yeah. with regards to, you know, choosing doctors from our hospital as well? So there's some questions to answer there as well. Basically, you say we take a lot of time and my time is up. So uh, thank you very much thank for you. the answers. And I give the word back to the ProRec. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Van Ginneke. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Klein. He's uh, Associate Professor of Medical Image Analysis at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Dr. Klein. Thank you. Yes, so uh, let me also start with um, first giving some con some congratulations. Um, I think it, it was really nice to read your thesis and I really especially appreciated both uh, the zoomed out contributions chapter that give a nice overview and also the very in-depth tec technical contributions. So it's a pleasure to read. Um, I have a lot of questions, so let me start quickly. Uh, first, I would like to start with uh, chapter 11. There you make a very strong point about making code, uh, so programming code available uh, to benefit reproducibility, to increase the impact. And I, I completely agree with that. So that was nice to read. And in chapter five, you indeed, you publish uh, all your code, but then for, I'm wondering where's the code of chapter six, seven and eight. I didn't, I couldn't find it. Esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your kind words uh, and for the question. Um, indeed, I think we, we agree on the same uh, principle. We try uh, in, in every study to uh, make models, um, models and code available. That's something that we really push for uh, every time we are, are working on a study. Um, in some instances, um, not trying to use it as an excuse, but in some instances, we, we do get pushback uh, from, um, uh, from collaborators uh, from whom we're using uh, data. Um, there is some um, concerns about being able to reverse engineer models uh, and uh, generate images, which I, which I personally believe is not very rooted, and I, I don't think there is much evidence to, to support this, but this is just one, uh, one example um, you know, uh, in terms of the pushback that we get. Um, but in principle, um, as, as long as we have control over the data, uh, that we use to generate the models. The models are uh, mainly based on open source tools uh, already. Um, and so uh, we definitely try to push for that every time. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's clear. I see that, uh, that problem with the data. Uh, so did you consider to at least share the code that you use? So without the, the finally trained models, but at least the code that you use to run the experiments that could already help, I think, other researchers. Indeed, yes. If we cannot share the, the model, then uh, it is the code. And if we cannot share the code um, for whatever reason, that um, means that the code could be used to regenerate the model. Uh, we, we end up sharing, um, for instance, for the segmentation project, we share uh, the actual segmentations that uh, match the same size as the images, the public images. And so researchers uh, are able to use these segmentations and benchmark against us. And we also always share 
uh, tabular tabular results of all our all our, um, uh, all our data that was used to generate uh, all the figures, and and this way kind of provides a little bit more uh, transparency into the project. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I would like to move to chapter seven. I think it was a very interesting, um, yeah, approach with the, with, the, with the recurrent neural network to analyze the longitudinal data. So I really like that idea. Uh, I have some questions about figure four. Um, that's on page 168. Yes. Um, and yeah, there you show nicely the effect of adding follow-up uh, images basically as yeah, input to the model. And you see with, with more uh, images, uh, yeah, the, the, the predictive performance improves. So th that's nice. I was um, wondering if you tried it the other way around, because here you start with just pre-treatment and then you add a follow-up one, follow-up two, follow-up three. Have you considered to also start with just a, a, a model that takes the follow-up tree as input? Because anyway, if you're combining it all, you, you already have follow-up tree. So you, and I would imagine that follow-up tree gives the most, I mean, contains the most information because it's the latest time point. Um, it's a very, very interesting approach. We, we have not tried uh, this, uh, this approach. Um, I think the, our our kind of hypothesis there was that the, the sequence the sequence uh, itself uh, is is contains more information than a single uh, than a single time point. Uh, we given that we use the recurrent neural networks and from work um, obviously on text sequences, uh, we know that uh, generally speaking, longer sequences uh, lead to better uh, model um, performance and understanding. Um, so we have not tried this, but I, I think it would be a very interesting uh, an interesting uh, experiment. Um, the other aspect here, I, th I think the ma main idea also behind this figure is that you know you're potentially you're just adding more data into the model, and that's potentially one reason why it's performing better. So mm -hmm. that's something we haven't been able to uh, kind of confirm if, if it's whether the longer sequence is better, leading to better performance, or it's just more data leading to better performance. Yeah, or more informative data that they need to, just the last time point yeah, is most pr predictive. So I could imagine that I I, I, I would go with you here yeah, with the, the hypothesis that yeah, the whole sequence includes uh, has the most information, but it's the question, of course, whether the deep learning model really ex can exploit it or re if it's really necessary. And if it would be possible to just use the latest image, then of course it would be simpler in, in practice. Yeah, then you don't have to collect all the, the older images. Correct. So uh, yeah, that, so that could be an interesting additional experiment if you have some some time left in the future. Um, yeah, then I have a question on on this recurrent neural network. Do you have any idea how the, this network is combining the information from these multiple time points? Is it looking at differences, but, yeah, change, or is it simply trying to predict the change in 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 size, for example? Um, have you looked at it and and can you share some insights on that? Yes. Uh, so uh, the input to the recurrent neural network is essentially a feature, a feature vector. So each uh, each time point, um, we use our kind of a more of a, like a pre-trained network to generate a feature vector, and that's the input to uh, to the recurrent neural network. Mm -hmm. um, my my intuition there is that um, through the gates in the recurrent neural network, it is making certain decisions and adjusting the weights of uh, which of these features. Um, gathered in sequence uh, is most predictive uh, to uh, to the problem and um, uh, you know our, I think our we haven't really uh, dug deep into uh, trying different recurrent networks uh, specifically you know we use the GRUs but uh, obviously there are uh, more and more uh, varieties out there uh, but I believe this this is kind of the the, the main uh, mechanism there mm -hmm. but you don't know exactly if it's looking at differences or just computing an average for example or uh... Yeah, we have we have not examined examined that. Okay. Uh, do I have time for another question or no? Okay. Uh, I thank you. It was uh, nice to discuss. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Klein. The next opponent is uh, Professor Peters. He is professor of mathematics in knowledge engineering at Maastricht University. Professor Peters. Thank you, uh, Mr. Prorector. And uh, dear candidate, first of all, my uh, congratulations with your uh, very nicely written uh, PhD thesis and. I'd also like to extend my congratulations to the uh, supervisory team and advise you on this. 
Um, I have a number of questions. Let me also get straight away to some of the technical details uh, I would like you to comment on. So in chapters five, six, and seven, you build these different deep learning networks on various tasks uh, related to lung cancer. Um, and eventually what we get to see is uh, a single deep learning network in each case. Uh, so I was wondering, um, how did you get to that? So, so you did training, I guess. Did you also examine other networks before you arrived at the configuration that you used and then that you trained? A highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much uh, for the kind note uh, and for the question. Um, I would say this is highly task specific. So um, for instance, in, uh, in chapter five, um, we, uh, we actually went on to study, um, look at, you know, experiment with different architectures and different structures. Um, and so this, this was more of an experimental case because uh, mainly because we were working with three dimensional input uh, images uh, and uh, we did not have the option to use a pre-trained uh, network on uh, photographic images. Uh, for the following chapters, um, um, the, the focus was more on uh, using a, a predefined architecture, making use, uh, making use of transfer learning in, in most of these cases. Uh, and the, the exercise there was to identify um, and to, to put in some, in some of these cases, uh, build additional uh, models that might or might not have been uh, deep, deep learning based. And it was more of a hyper, hyper parameter uh, optimization in these cases. Yeah, because I, I'm asking because if you do so, and then uh, in fact, you're training multiple networks, you're looking at multiple options, see how they perform. And in a way that, uh, that biases the outcomes, uh, it favors the, the one you eventually select. <laughs> And that uh, is, yeah, yeah that, that, that is that is correct. Yes. Um, so we try to address this by having a, a train and a tune and a test uh, data set with the test locked. But but to your point, of course, the more you use, the more you are testing on the tune data set, the more it becomes part of the training data, and the more you are kind of uh, overfitting on it. So uh, so we tr we try to limit the work that we do on the tuning as as much as we. Can. Okay, yeah that, yeah, that makes it clear, yeah. Um, then, then I would like to, to ask a more general question uh, because in chapters one to four, you, you have a very broad overview of uh, all the um, promises that, uh, that are held by AI on, on the medical field, uh, so to say. Uh, and you also mentioned some perceived drawbacks uh, that, that human assessment of, of images brings. Um, and sometimes implicitly, maybe sometimes explicitly, you, you claim that they, these are, can be overcome with AI. Now, is that really true? Because if I look at uh, the AI models that you develop, uh, they also hold biases because you make choices that are subjectivity, but it's a bit in disguised form. You fix the network, the structure, the parameters eventually, uh, and you train it on certain data. And now that data will be the basis for all future decisions. So could you comment on, on that point of view? Um, indeed, uh, the, the model is, is only going to be as good, uh, as good as the data. And uh, also to your point about uh, reflecting certain biases in the data. Um, I think um, with regards to making a general point about uh, how um, generally um, you know, machine learning or, or AI in this case can, uh, can help uh, in certain situations, um, I think we really position it as more of a clinical decision support um, as, as a tool uh, in, in the doctor's toolbox and being able to access it uh, when needed. And uh, indeed, in order to make this claim that, uh, you know, AI has the potential to address many, many issues, um, I believe that we are on, on the way but have not, uh, have, are not there yet, uh, given just the lack of um, robust validation that, that we still need in the field. Okay, that that smoothly brings me to my to my final question because uh, looking at this, eh, um, you you basically want to introduce and you make a strong case actually for introducing AI into the medical field in particular into to imaging uh, applications in medicine, um, and I, and I like that a lot, but it's not really in my opinion about trying to replace humans on a number of tasks, uh, but really about um, maybe not even support them, but about collaborating with new technology. And uh, that new field in AI is called hybrid intelligence. Uh, you may have heard of that. 
uh, and, and that's a, something slightly different than just supporting uh, on human decision making or leaving everything to the computer. It's, it's really about collaborating. Um, and my question is, having seen the workflows you have in these first four chapters and also in the later discussion, um, shouldn't they be adapted to make that possible instead of sticking with the old workflow and trying to insert AI into that? Indeed, uh, thank you for the question. Um, we believe that one of the biggest barriers actually to implementation is uh, lies more on the human factors side. Um, you know, do doctors are, you know, it's a very risk averse environment as it's supposed to be. And uh, doctors are um, accustomed to workflows in very specific ways and they have been doing it for years uh, and, you know, patient comes first uh, and, and, and many other considerations. And uh, today we have very little understanding of uh, uh, human uh, AI uh, interaction uh, in, in general. So this is uh, obviously also an up, up and coming field and more so, much more so needed uh, in the medical uh, context. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there are automation tools that exist in the clinic today. And you might, uh, you might, uh, you know, ask the question, well, why aren't they used? Is it a performance issue? Are they implemented, uh, implemented properly? And so, uh, you know, definitely agree with your point that we need to rethink the workflows uh, instead of uh, the addition of an, 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 AI, an AI assistant tool uh, that may not uh, uh, end up being used at all. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Sorry. And the thank you. Back to the corrector. Thank you, uh, Professor Peters. The opposition will be continued by Professor De Ruijsje. He is Professor of Radiation Oncology and Res Respiratory Oncology at Maastricht University. Professor De Ruijsje. Thank you very much, Mr. Prorector. I want, of course, uh, from my side also congratulate you, uh, dear candidate, with your excellent uh, PhD thesis, of course, very relevant, uh, and also congratulate all your team and your family as well. <laughs> it's also a big burden for them, a PhD thesis. Now, I want to start first with a question about the delineation, of course. And my, my question is, what is actually your ground truth? Because we are always talking also in your answers now about the, the, the machine, call it machine, uh, the, the computer and the human. But what is actually the ground truth when delineating the tumor and the lymph nodes? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your uh, kind words and for the question. And um, this is a million dollar question. <laughs> uh, this is something that uh, we discussed internally uh, quite extensively. Uh, of course, given the, the variability that you're uh, very uh, well aware of. Uh, the way we decided to work around it is to say, okay, we don't have ground truth and maybe that's fine. And what we can do is uh, we can explicitly train a model on a given, uh, um, a given expert's data. And so we're, uh, in one way, uh, we are forcing bias into the model by saying, learn the styles and preferences of this expert. And this allowed us, at least in this experiment, to understand, well, how does style affect uh, the performance uh, of the model? But at the same time, it's, uh, it was a way for us to say, um, when, when this model is provided as a clinical decision support to another doctor to say, hey, this model highly reflects the styles of expert X, the, the, the expert that was used uh, to, uh, expert data that was used to train uh, the model. Uh, and this starts to provide kind of a reference uh, of experience to say, well, this expert has 10 years of uh, thoracic experience, uh, and you start to kind of have a little bit better understanding of what this model uh, can, can perform. Um, and so the, really the, the problem of, of ground truth uh, has, has been one that has been very, very difficult to, uh, to come around. Indeed, because when I see some of your examples, which you also showed in your presentation, and then you see the differences between doctors and so on, what I see there is actually what kind of image did you provide to the doctors and to the system in order to do the delineation? Because in reality, we don't rely on one single imaging modality, even not on a CT scan without contrast, but a whole range of different information, including endoscopic information, for instance. Could you in improve the, let's call it again, the ground truth by adding this and feeding your model with this uh, information as well? Absolutely, yes. One, one of the drawbacks uh, of our study uh, was um, for uh, advanced stage uh, patients, um, usually PET modality is, uh, is also used. And this helps to guide uh, 
uh, doctors in selecting the uh, infected lymph nodes. Uh, we did not use uh, use PET in, in our study, although we believe that uh, CT PET combination as it is commonly used uh, is something that we can use to better uh, enhance the model. Uh, specifically with uh, the more distant uh, lymph nodes uh, that are uh, that we've found that is uh, are kind of quite difficult for our model to pick up uh, only from CT. So do you envisage to do that? So a classical PET CT scan and 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 even some information would that be possible? Do you envisage yes. to 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 use that? Yes, um, and we also also discussed how um, PET could be used because uh, you know once you standardized uh, you have normalized your SUVs, then you're able to perform um, relatively simple I would say relatively simple thresholding uh, to identify the quote unquote uh, hot areas, and these hot areas could be used to actually guide the guide the, the model and. Uh, it, it would help us specifically in our automated pipeline where we actually go out and, and try to detect uh, the tumor and the lymph nodes. This would help that model uh, immensely. Yeah. I, I would even suggest not to use a, a SUV, but that's another discussion. I, I was a little bit surprised that you use the DICE index um, as a, one of the ways to measure the performance because I think that the DICE index in some cases makes sense, but when, when you look at small volumes, what does the DICE index mean then? Absolutely, 100%. I mean, uh, the problems, uh, so we're, we're kind of stuck in, in, in the middle here because volumetric DICE is the most common uh, metric that is used, uh, I would say in large, very large percent of uh, similar studies. On the other hand, as you've kindly mentioned, there are multiple problems with it, uh, including a bias towards larger, uh, larger tumors, including uh, the the problem of um, uh, penalizing uh, voxels inside and outside equally, and of course for a radiotherapy context, uh, missing the tumor is is a much more fatal than uh, than you know uh, may per perhaps potentially irradiating uh, healthy some healthy tissue, uh, and so uh, the the volumetric dice is not ideal. One uh, metric that uh, is kind of up and coming and we uh, are kind of very excited about is the surface dice. Uh, and uh, the fact, the idea here is that you're providing a tolerance uh, of say one, two millimeters and measuring the distance between the surfaces. We found from our experience that the surface dice, uh, that clinicians like the surface dice a lot because it's, uh, it's something that they can understand. And you can say a surface dice of 80 means that 80% of the surface is within two millimeters uh, from, uh, from the quote unquote ground truth. Um, and so um, we, we try to kind of use both, both, both report both these metrics. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to, dis to continue this discussion, but in this, for the sake of time, I give the word back to the pro rector. Thank you. You have still one minute left if you like. Oh, then, then I will continue, of course. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, I, 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 because of, of time, I, I won't uh, ask you to read uh, your statement uh, or your proposition uh, three about, um, you know, that you would uh, use the AI to connect and trust human touch between patients and doctors. Don't you think that, uh, or I would like to, to, to know that the AI could, uh, on one hand, of course, increase uh, the, 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 the variability or decrease the variability, but also decrease the increasing costs of uh, healthcare. You may, hmm. you may give a short answer, please. Yeah, a very short answer. Thank you, thank you for the question. Um, indeed, I mean, uh, if you look at the radiation, uh, uh, radiation oncology practice and the number of highly specialized professionals, um, the, the time that is spent in front of the computer uh, is you know very high. It's a very data intensive, computer intensive um, um, uh, um, domain, and the whole idea behind uh, the human the human kind of touch is having radiation oncologists spend less time in front uh, of the computers and ideally more time uh, with with the patients. That's that's really the the high level point behind uh, that proposition. Okay, thank you. I give the word back to Mr. Paul. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor de Ruijser. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Professor Verhagen. He is Professor in Radiation Physics and Imaging. Professor Verhagen. Thank you. Um, yes, allow me to be the last in the row then to uh, congratulate you with your very comprehensive 
and very carefully uh, executed thesis. It was really a pleasure to read it. Um, I have my first question is about uh, chapter eight on page 197. I read um, that you trained your model on non contrast uh, CT images, but that then somehow it performed better on images that had contrast. And this I find a bit puzzling because, in my understanding, I think uh, if you train a model on a certain set of data, and as soon as you start deviating from that set of data significantly, the model should always perform worse, right? So you know why in this case it's performing better now? Um, highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for the, the kind words and for the question. Uh, indeed, this was uh, one of our kind of puzzling um, findings. Um, we, we know, uh, given uh, the experiments that we ran uh, with the residents and the attendings, uh, that uh, they prefer to segment on uh, contrast enhanced that is relatively easier for them uh, to uh, to perform the task. So from a human standpoint, uh, we know that the contrast helps with the uh, with the task. Um, one hypothesis to make here is it's very likely that, uh, um, and just to, uh, to clarify, our training data consists of around 40% contrast uh, enhanced, and that, that was kind of the 60-40 split. And it's very likely that the model um, uh, is, is, is kind of has biased itself towards uh, the contrast enhanced images because these are essentially the images that are uh, the easier to segment. Uh, we, we have not uh, dug deeper into this, uh, but I could imagine a, fur a further study uh, where we um, perhaps just as a starting point, naively train uh, two models on these two different subsets uh, and, and see uh, how they perform uh, also inversely on images with uh, and without contrast. Yeah, so that, that would perhaps be a method then to, to investigate this a bit more, but I still find it a bit puzzling yeah, because in general, it always performs worse for unseen data, let's say. And uh, yeah, it's a bit uh, puzzling. Um, my next question is about, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, chapter um, four. Um, on page 124, you are describing uh, masking the tumor uh, and then you see that the performance of your CNN is decreasing, which kind of makes sense. Um, that's what we expect, but not much. I notice in the table there that your performance is, is almost, uh, yeah, it's a bit lower, but I would say it's still very good. And then I find puzzling when you basically throw away the information in the image inside the tumor, yeah, that's what you mean by masking, I guess, um, that the model still works so well. So what, what does that then actually mean? Um, thank you for the question. Um, one of the findings that uh, we found is that, uh, again, coming back to the idea of the volume, the volume feature, um, that the uh, specifically for radiotherapy patients, uh, we know that volume is a very, very strong uh, predictor of uh, multiple uh, outcomes. And in this case, we hypothesized that um, that the masking exercise is um, is enforcing uh, much of that volume information. And so, um, on one hand, and on one hand, you're losing context, uh, but on the other hand, you're reinforcing uh, the the volume feature in a way, and that that could be something that the that the model is uh, is is picking up on, and that might uh, explain the fact that it's uh, it's it's not doing much worse, but uh, just a little bit worse in that case. Ah, so you are saying, if I understood you correctly, that by providing the mask, the mask, which is kind of an artificial. Uh, Part that is not really part of the anatomy, obviously, but the shape and the size of the mask itself is being used by the by the network to derive information, basically. Indeed, to describe both the volume and and the shape, as uh, as you've mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but but you think it doesn't mean that um, that there are very important regions outside the tumor. You you mentioned that a little bit, eh? but uh, I don't think you investigated it in great detail or what it actually then means that uh, regions outside the tumor have a very important uh, part to play in the decision of the network? So yes, indeed. And the, uh, uh, the interpretability studies were um, quite preliminary. Um, and uh, I think since then the, there have been uh, different, multiple different methods of performing such interpretability studies. So I, I do agree that, uh, th that the results were preliminary in nature. Um, but uh, we, we think this is a very, very interesting avenue of research, specifically in radiotherapy, 
specifically being able to uh, identify uh, areas in image where toxicity is likely, is for instance, likely to occur. So we'd be using the same interpretability method to identify, uh, you know, areas that uh, are, are beyond the tumor, the tumor volume. Um, yeah. So more, more investigation is definitely needed there. Yes, yes. Okay, but it's definitely a promising approach. And then maybe already my final question, I guess, in your chapter six, eh, you introduce these heat maps. I think that's an interesting idea, especially if you show them at, uh, at different levels going down in the convolution. Eh? Um, but my question is, um, did you ever show these heat maps to, to medical doctors or is this mostly meant for yourself eh, to develop the, or improve the network and use it as a kind of a feedback on uh, maybe at which convolution level you have lost all information or the information looks like complete nonsense or whatever. Yes, um, in, in this case, uh, the, 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 these heat maps were mainly meant as a kind of engineering debugging. Uh, so it's ability for us to kind of understand uh, the model mechanics. Uh, but I do agree with you that the end user uh, interpretability heat maps could uh, potentially uh, be displayed in a different way. Uh, they could potentially be displaying uh, different information. And so in this case, it's important to, um, to kind of distinguish between engineering interpretability and end user interpretability. Yeah, I think it might be just a completely interesting experiment. I see, that, I see that the beetle has shouted the horror as oh, I'm, yeah. I'm sure um, that you are aware, uh, Mr. Hosni, that the time for defending your thesis has passed. The committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and in particular the quality of your defense. And please await our return and the results of our deliberations. Thank you.
Do I see Mr. Hosni? Yes. Mr. Hosni, um, the degree committee here present online has assessed the quality of your thesis and in particular the quality of your defense today. And in view of this positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. And Professor Arndt is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom and law. The floor is now to your supervisor, Professor Arndt. Uh, thank you. Uh, so Ahmed, uh, do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times? Uh, be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible. Yes, I promise. Uh, so by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee uh, pre presented uh, here online, I hereby confer upon you, Amnet Hosni, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, you will soon receive the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the supervisor, affixed with the official seal of the university shown by the beadle. Thank you. All right, um, um, great work. So now I can, uh, it is my honor to talk about the uh, Laudatio for you. So it is a real honor to stand here today and talk about Ahmed. Uh, what is very interesting about Ahmed is his whole path in life that brought him here. So he was actually trained as an architect uh, in the Middle East. And after that, he uh, went to China to work uh, several years uh, in uh, the construction of certain buildings. Uh, after that, he did, uh, after he did that for a couple of years, um, he wanted to do something else and he applied and got into a very prestigious science and arts program uh, at Harvard University, from which he also got his master's. Uh, for this, of course, he needed to move to Boston and he started working on also more engineering kind of problems uh, centered around visual image analysis, for which he had to learn also a lot of new skills in computer science and data science. So what is a very funny fact there uh, is that um, uh, Steve Piper, a colleague of ours that I respect a lot, actually worked with Ahmed and told me about him. Uh, and he said that Ahmed was very bright and very hardworking uh, and potentially uh, even interested in a PhD in my lab. So I asked a bit about, you know, who is this Ahmed? What do you think about him? And so he told me a bit about his background uh, with arch being an architect and so on. So I was very hesitant, you know, like, because, you know, like, we have great candidates with great and with heavy engineering degrees. Why would I select an architect for this? But, you know, Steve convinced me that, you know, at least talk to the guy. Um, and oh boy, I could have been more wrong. Uh, from the first moment I met him in my office, I knew for sure we needed to hire him and that he would be a great and successful addition to the team. So once you get to know Ahmed, it's very clear that he's a man with many, many skills. Uh, he's clearly very bright. What is also very unique is that of course, due to his background, uh, is that he has very strong skills in many, many different fields that are needed uh, to be a good scientist. So he's very creative about developing very uh, uh, complex and new ideas about projects and analyses. He's very skilled in developing very complex and novel deep learning architectures, but also he's creative into how to visualize a very complex scientific problem uh, into a very simple figure, some, something that is very, very hard to do. And of course, as it was typical to Ahmed, um, the first project he selected was a very large and hard problem that was high risk, but could make a lot of impact if successful. So he started to investigate how to use uh, deep learning algorithms and radiomics research, a study that was also discussed today. And as it was such a large project with many data sets and analyses that needed to be performed, it took several years before it was completed. What made this study very special was that from the start, he wanted to drill much deeper into the uh, problem than most people do. So he did many, many uh, detailed experiments to better prove the real clinical value of these deep learning algorithms. And all that hard work was worth it. Uh, he completed a very nice scientific study uh, that is currently cited by many other investigators uh, and also considered a benchmark in the field. But also because he could helicopter very well and he could have see problems at a very high level, he quickly developed a strong view of the medical AI field. And he started developing his own ideas about this. So one study he wrote that was published in Nature Reviews uh, was a perspective article about how AI will transform the field of radiology. This study is now seen as a leading study in the field 
already cited more than 1,200 times. And even news outlets like the New York Times and uh, uh, Wired wrote about this study. Another perspective that he got that got a lot of attention was published in the Journal of Science about the potential impact for AI in global health and all the good AI can do there. I don't even have time to talk about the other uh, articles he published in journals like Nature and The Lancet. So all in all, he's been extremely successful. So all of these uh, impressive skills together with this nice personality quickly made him into a cornerstone of the lab. The lab members worked, uh, liked working with him a lot. Uh, and he made sure that new lab members uh, found a, uh, a nice home with us. A nice memory I have is that Ahmed is also a pilot and he took several lab members uh, in his plane with him, including me. So on a not too windy day without any rain, rain, we drove to a small airport close to the city. Uh, and before he took uh, off, he walked me around the plane and told me many important details about the engine and the wings, uh, facts I needed to remember, of course, for my own safety. But of course, I forgot all of it immediately when he told me. Uh, so we took off um, and we have a fantastic uh, flight, even flying over the city of Boston, which is a pretty special thing to do, uh, and landed on a very small island close to the city. Uh, he even let me fly for about 45 minutes, which still now reflecting back on was, I think it was not a very safe thing to do. Um, on a personal level, I also really enjoyed um, uh, our conversations and really got to know him. Uh, I love discussing many as aspects of life with him all the way, you know, what is happiness and how should it be defined to, you know, how should the scientific world look like? Um, although he is, was, and is still very young, he has a very mature brain and always a very interesting angle to different uh, issues. All right, Ahmed, it is a great pleasure and honor to be here today. And have you seen, uh, grown into a remarkable scientist? I'm proud to have been part of your development, and I'm certain you will have a great future ahead of you, whatever direction you may pursue, even if this is in business, as we like to call it, the dark side. Uh, with this, I would like to finish and ask the audience to give you a lot of uh, applause, something you really deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Esteemed uh, Dr. Hosni, dear Ahmed, um, it's my great pleasure to congratulate you with the doctorate and the honor that you have required today. And I do that also on behalf of the Board of Deans of Maastricht University. And maybe I may share some impressions of the committee with you. Um, well, we have seen a very interesting and a very clear presentation. And we have seen also a thesis of a, a high quality and also uh, most of the work is uh, published in high, highly standard uh, journals. And it was also well written. And it showed us a creative and um, a creative researcher and writer. We saw an interesting defense. It was fast. You gave fast responses, um, interesting responses. And you did not deviate from the questions. And we have seen that you are very knowledgeable uh, of the field and also can demonstrate a helicopter view. And I think that's quite important. And also important is that we have seen that you also think about to go beyond the results of your thesis. And we appreciated your defense very, very much. I would like to congratulate your two supervisors with the result that we have seen today, both in the thesis and both in the form of, um, of your defense. And uh, I think um, uh, Dr. Uh, Hugo Aerts and Dr. Raymond Beck, you may be very proud of this candidate. We don't see this very much, this high quality. So I congratulate you with this result. And I include in my congratulations um, your family, your parents, uh, your sister, and also, of course, your partner and the other members of your family. And I would like to include also all the ones who have contributed to your studies, your publications, and to your thesis. And I wish you a very successful professional career and a happy personal life. Before I close the ceremony, I would like to thank all the members of the thesis assessment committee and of this degree committee, and in particular, all the external members and all opponents for their questions and the interesting academic discussions. Maastricht University 
appreciates your contributions to these committees. Hereby, I close this academic ceremony.